where we have bite-sized conversations with people from the Android community. I'm Chuki Chan, and today we're speaking with... Valera Zakharov. Hello, Valera. Hello. And uh, where are you based and what do you do? Uh, I am based here in San Francisco, uh, mm -hmm. so welcome to San Francisco, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I am the tech lead of the Android Developer Experience team at Slack. And we are at Slack. Yay! Cool. And how do you get started on Android? I got started on Android in, back in 2011, actually, a okay. uh, long time ago. Um, I joined Google, and my first project was a very exciting project called Google Wallet. Woohoo! Google Wallet! Yeah. <laughs> Best thing what ever! What happened to that? Oh, okay. Whatever. <laughs> and then? Um, funny thing is, actually, my manager here um, at Slack was also on that project, so mm. uh, we reunited okay. at cool. Slack. So then, you, are you continuously doing Android since then, or are you jumping in uh, and out of it? Yeah, so I started um, as a software engineer in test, uh, trying to help the Google Wallet team mm -hmm. uh, ramp up Android testing, mm -hmm. uh, which at that time was kind of scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then I kind of quickly realized that the problems that um, me and a few other people were trying to solve applied to the rest of Google, not just the Google Wallet team. Mm -hmm. And so we formed our own uh, team called Mobile Ninjas, uh, and uh, we started doing tooling for um, for all of Google and even external people. So, right. um, so ever since then, I've been working on tooling. When I first joined Slack uh, here, I was um, doing feature development. I had decided I want to try that out, actually. Uh, but then I discovered that I still like infrastructure. <laughs> back to, work, so, back to tooling. So I'm now yeah. back uh, to working on infrastructure. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I asked because uh, I'm here because I want to ask about Espresso, which Valera worked on when he was at Google. Um, part of the reason why I was very interested is because I do a lot of espresso testing, but at some point things start to become flaky and unreliable, the tests take, test take a long time to run, and you actually spend a little bit of time kind of making it work for Slack, so I just want to know yeah. what, what, how do you make it work? Cause, yeah. um, Testing is great when it works, but a lot of the times you just hit roadblock after roadblock, it's really easy to get discouraged, so I want to know your story. Yeah, it's actually... Uh... This is, you know, a very um, good point uh, that just the test framework itself is not enough um, yeah. for for testing. Yeah. And this problem has existed for a very long time. We actually, when I was at Google, we gave a presentation about the test environment back in 2013 at GTAC, um, mm -hmm. Google Test Automation Conference. Right. And we actually mostly talked about how to execute tests, uh, how to set up a good mobile testing environment. Um, so that's like actually the base. Um, then having a good test framework is very important also mm -hmm. to author the tests. Uh, but yeah, um, here at Slack, when I arrived, thankfully, I already had the knowledge of what was done at Google. Right. Um, so it was kind of easier to, you know, to at least know what to do. Uh, but of course, then don't have the same resources. We don't have the data centers. Right, we don't right. have the infrastructure set up. So, um, so here I had to, you know, do a lot of things with well, what's out there. You know, basically external tooling. Yeah. Um, knowing that we're not going to build our data center just yet. Um, so, so, do you have a device farm? Do you run things on emulator? Yeah. Like, um, I am a big proponent of uh, running things on emulators because okay. uh, I've seen it again work at Google mm -hmm. at, at a huge scale. Mm -hmm. And I know that you can get the emulator, you can configure it correctly. Um, uh, it's, it's a really great tool and actually performs better than physical devices. Mm -hmm. Um, but the problem is um, that yeah, like you have to go through all that configuration stuff, right. and it just doesn't work out of the box. Yeah. So we got started here at Slack uh, when I arrived. We actually we didn't have any espresso test cases. Uh, the developers mm -hmm. um, were, were not writing those, um, and we were just running things on on Jenkins and using the Jenkins Android uh, emulator plugin. Um, okay. And they were using the ARM emulator to run their unit tests. Okay. Um, so once we actually started writing UI tests um, and instrumentation tests, uh, we were faced with the problem of like where to execute them, and obviously the ARM emulator is just not good enough for that. Yeah. Um, so one of my first projects there was to set up um, a few local build nodes that were capable of running the x86 emulator right. in sort of fast mode. Right. Um, and so I did that, and I you know was finally able to configure things correctly, mm -hmm. and we uh, we had three wonderful local build nodes that were executing our tests. So by build node, just three computers? Yeah, three machines. Like, <laughs> okay. uh, it sitting, sounds pretty sitting, fancy. Sitting, sitting, seriously, like so sitting yeah. in my, you know... So it's on site, you don't do cloud. Yeah, on somebody's desk, okay. yeah. yeah. So at that point, that's what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, at the scale, you know, we had like, let's say, 50 test cases at that point. 
uh, and we were executing them on you know every um, every pull to master or every merge to master. Wait, so if you have three machines, mm -hmm. do you have tools to merge the results coming back from them, or they each one? No, each one. Completely? Yeah, it's just, okay. It's just yeah, for it's not sharded. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, it's not sharded. So. So I've, that was just the first very simple attempt, you know, okay. run all the tests uh, sort of sequentially um, and, you know, get some results back. And ultimately I was able to like actually massage it to be somewhat reliable, but then of Ooh. course as people started writing more tests, now yeah. we have something like 600 tests, let's say espresso tests. Wow. Uh, you know, the throughput was just not big enough. Um, yeah. And at that point we, you know, we took the next step and we moved to the cloud. So. Okay. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of interesting. I feel like I do a lot of testing, partly because I do kind of TDD. So what I like to do is I, I mock the server before the server team is ready and I like do everything within the testing. And then at the end of the day, I have a test. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll try to run it. But that means that over the three years, I build up a lot of tests and then it just takes forever to yeah. run the whole suite. Like, how do you make it so that it, you know, actually run fast enough so that people will actually run it because if takes things takes longer than lunch is kind of my like yeah. metric. If you yeah. cannot start it and come go to lunch and come back, no yeah. one will ever run it. So how no, do you I mean, our, sure our, sort of our sweet spot, yeah. you know, we're trying to get to like under let's say fifteen minutes, but ideally wow, even yeah. less, you know, to run the nice. entire test suite. Yeah. Uh, and that includes the six hundred, I mean fifteen yeah. Yeah. minutes, not a lot of time for for yeah. UI. So how do you do that? Yeah, so we parallelize obviously the right. solution to everything. Um, and we uh, yeah essentially we have a just our own custom Python script that we wrote in house that uh, open shards source, open source, open yeah. source. <laughs> um, yeah we could can think about it. Let's yeah, let's think, think about, about it. it. <laughs> uh, I don't know what kind of yeah. The code is actually in decent shape. It has unit tests and everything. So right. yeah, it could be open sourced. Uh, but uh, this script just uh, shards things out and runs them on Firebase Test Lab. Oh okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so we were you know we were at a point where we were considering whether to build out our in-house sort of emulator farm. Um, and to right. manage all the Jenkins stuff, yeah. um, and for us, Jenkins is a real source of pain, actually. So we, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. I moved away from Jenkins, so I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so managing that seemed pretty daunting, and we decided to just evaluate Firebase, um, and for the most part, it works. There are a lot of limitations, and you have to work around them. Yeah. And we script it basically around those. Yeah, things. I was going to ask because I know like Slack uses Firebase, and I couldn't get like Firebase test lab to work because I need to run each test method separately. Yeah. Because there's some state leaks. I don't even know where things are leaking. Yeah. Uh, so, but the default way of running things from both Android Studio and on Firebase test lab is you just run the yeah. whole thing, and it doesn't it never worked basically? Yeah. So like so the Python script that you mentioned does that kind we, of command. So we did something that's <laughs> kind of tricky and maybe a little bit hacky. It's mm -hmm. a lot hacky. Is uh, we first attempt to run every test class separately. So we found that if you run every test class um, in a separate so one per Java file. Yeah, yeah, one per Java file yeah. exactly. Um, then you know we get some failures. Maybe sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And okay. then we take the failures and we rerun them. Uh, oh. So and then those the reruns happen like every method is run individually oh. and in parallel also. Okay. So sometimes uh, you know we get lucky and everything succeeds the first time and then it's like great because the build finishes in like eight minutes. Right, right. And then sometimes we have an extra overhead of like another five minutes to rerun the failures. Mm -hmm. It's not a great system. I think we can still you know that can be approved a lot and and really we shouldn't be having to do this. I know, I know. Part, so. Yeah, that's the <laughs> other thing where I feel like you know I want to use. One of the, another frustration, I, I work for a really small startup, so every experimentation I do with Firebase Cloud, I have to pay. Yeah. <laughs> like, so like, oh, yeah. so they're like, it does not work. Let me try again. It yeah. still doesn't work. I don't know how much you know. I yeah. want to invest in it before I have confidence that I can get it to a point where I can actually use it with confidence. Yeah. So I mean, it's nice to hear you know hacks, tricks, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, cause like you know, launching each chess method separately will take longer, mm -hmm. right? So I, I like your approach of trying it first and then if it fails and then isolate and see if it can. Yeah, and some people pass. will claim that okay, like if your tests don't pass, you know, because of shared state, that's a, the problem with your tests, but we found yeah, it's just sometimes Android is very stateful. There's lots of, 
you know, yeah. state everywhere, and it's just some really really hard to get developers to think about that, you know, especially when yeah. you don't have a local repro. Like you're running the test locally, you don't see the same problems. So, so I think it's uh, the ultimate solution definitely lies with with the Firebase team uh, doing instrumenting things correctly, where you just give them to test a, you know your APK in the right. tests. And they orchestrate everything correctly, and they do the parallelization for you. They do the sharding. Um, yeah. I think that if you know if they got that to that point, uh, people would use the solution a lot, that, yeah. you know, a lot more. So I know, for example, we are. You know, it took us a while to get to the point where we are. But for example, we only run on one API level right now on one screen resolution. We would love to run. Right. Yeah. You know, Ideally, that's a yeah. whole suite of different yeah. configurations that right. you could be trying. And we, yeah. you know, now if we were to try to extend it, we have to extend our script to do this, the sharding properly across different screen resolutions and API levels. And again, this is something that every single shop, you know, development shop is going to have to do. So yeah. it doesn't make sense to do that um, on the client side. You, the server should handle that. Yeah, I, I'm like I feel like I'm suffering because I'm so disciplined in writing tests, and now I'm paying the price because each test uh, takes a long time to run when you do UI tests. So like, how about the unit testing side of things? Like, do you also try to separate the logic out and try to avoid espresso until yeah, you need to? Absolutely. I, I gave a talk, you know, last year mm -hmm. about. You know, I know that espresso exists, and it's like we, of course you we know espresso right, exists. We, we advertise it as you know, we advertise espresso as like, hey, if you use this you, framework, you'll never have flaky tests. But in fact, there's a lot of other things you have to do. Um, right. Like you have to make your tests small and targeted and hermetic. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the the first thing I say in that presentation of how to write a UI test is if you can avoid writing a UI test, <laughs> don't. Avoid, don't write a UI test. Yeah. And absolutely, yeah. like you know, when I got here, we actually you know. The developers did a great job by picking up Espresso and writing uh, a lot of UI tests, but mm -hmm. our testing pyramid started right. with inverting. Yeah. You know? And so they, they again, did an awesome job on actually starting to use the MVP pattern. So we had a, you know, yeah. we had a... I'm new in the MVP yeah. church, but I love it. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, uh, there's many different ways of doing it, and like there's no yeah. single standard way yet on right. Android to do this. Right. Uh, so that, that can be a little bit tricky, but I think the the investment in that area is definitely yeah. pays off really quickly because your testing cycles are much shorter. Right. You you write fewer UI tests. Your UI tests really focus on the UI bits, like the that things are inflated correctly and set right. wired up correctly. Yeah. And the business logic then you yeah. know stays with the presenter, and you test that on the JVM, so which is yeah. great. Yeah. Before I know about the MVP pattern, I see the testing pyramid, and it's like you have to have unit tests. I'm like. How hard? Yeah. Good luck with Android. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> like how on earth are you going to have business logic? Because yeah. in my mind, business logic is really like crunching numbers and stuff. Like most of my app are like fetch this from the internet, render it, yeah. handle this click, and render something else. I don't really have a lot of logic. But then after I learned about MVP, then I realized that there is actually a lot of logic in terms of like is this an error state? I right. need to call the error handling mm -hmm. function, yeah. or like you know someone click this one particular button, which I need to give them a warning before enabling the button. Yeah. So and like there's like the data crunching. You know, you fetch some data and like you need to massage it to you know right. to present it yeah. on the UI, and that, that part definitely needs to to be unit tested. And you, there's no reason to write espresso tests for that. Yeah, exactly. So I I right now I'm. It's kind of funny. I'm like interviewing you, but I'm actually in the process of moving away from doing too much espresso because I, I finally, I finally have the tools to do it. Yeah. Like with with uh, MVP, mm -hmm. which is very robust, though, right? Yeah. Like you have to have all these interfaces, and you can't mm -hmm. like swim between mm -hmm. Java, pure Java, and then Android, and swim like up and down. Yeah, there's um, definitely some overhead, yeah. and I think that you know, again, I wish that there was one standard way of doing it, and I wish Robo that maybe. Logic? Maybe even the free. <laughs> do no. you do RoboElectric? <laughs> uh, we we do. We started using RoboElectric. Yeah. Um, I think the with RoboElectric you have to be careful to mm -hmm. you know use RoboElectric only to fake out certain dependencies on Android, um, but not use it as a as the Android framework for right. you know the presentation layer, which you can do. So. Yeah, uh, I wish that's a RoboElectric minimum dependency that doesn't have shadow activities mm -hmm. or shadow anything. Yeah. That they are just all 
real classes that got copied over. I think, yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, from what I've read in the in Robo Electric sort of roadmap, yeah. they're they're heading that way. So I think yeah. they're doing all the right things, and uh, Robo Electric now being part of Google, hopefully. Right, yeah. that's true. I think it'll get more love. It'll get more love, <laughs> and I think yeah. they're they're kind of coordinating together. So that we should see some really good stuff there in the cool. future. Um, just got one final question. Do you actually track your test coverage or are there, are there any metric for like mm -hmm. making sure that yeah. you know, you're actually testing what you should be testing? Yeah, we, we do code coverage. We're not yet at the point. What I would love to get to the point where when you open a PR and you don't have any new tests and you've added a bunch of lines of code, right. we actually display like a red box that right. says you're dropping code coverage. So yeah. differential code coverage, mm. something that Google actually had in their build system. I would love to have that here, and right. we're, we will build that out. But for right now, we're just we're just tracking the trend, you know, with yeah. time. Um, well, well, the thing is, like, I basically didn't do cold coverage because I felt like if I only do like majority espresso tests, cold coverage is kind of meaningless. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you are actually testing the logic, then you do want all the branching paths yeah. and want not to be tested yeah. because you know I have a try catch block and you know mm -hmm. the never the error doesn't happen because um, yeah. you know it's really yeah. not so you do you track coverage for both UI tests and like Yeah, we, we merge it. Okay. Um, there's a plugin I think for Gradle that does Ooh. merged code coverage. I don't remember the name, but um, okay. it's it's out there. Yeah. Um, it's code coverage is like just one of the metrics. If you have one hundred percent code coverage, right. you definitely doesn't mean that everything is great. Right. But if you have zero code coverage, it means everything sucks. It's a, so yeah, necessary can, but not sufficient yeah, condition. <laughs> it can tell you that things are bad. It cannot yeah. tell you if things are good. Right. Um, right. Yeah. But it's definitely an easy metric to focus on. But it's also a nice reminder for people yeah. when they are checking in code that, oh yeah, right, that's this testing thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Sometimes people forget. But the other yeah. thing we are, we're just starting to track now is the quality of our tests. So uh, we instrumented this, this Python script that runs our UI tests. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're now going to upload all the stats, uh, you know, the pass-fail stats. Right. And uh, I hope to sort of build out a system where developers can say, oh, this was a flaky test, and they mm -hmm. can actually uh, mark that as a flaky test, and we can track that over time. Because um, we really want, we still have a problem with flakiness, um, and we want to drive that down to, like, bare minimum. Um, I, you know, I, I dream of a kind of a system where uh -huh. If you have a flaky test failure um, that gives a false alert to a developer, that that's like we have a post mortem around that, and we like say, oh, well, like you know, this <laughs> wow. is like a server, like when you know. I know that like that's my dream. That's I get like, flaky tests just because someone was <laughs> clicking on a spinner and <laughs> yeah. the animation, you know, the yeah. system didn't wait for the animation. I'm like, I'm not gonna hold a post mortem for that. You well, know? I mean, yeah. like uh, <laughs> you can have a system that like evicts your flaky test and like moves them out and like you know, and actually yeah. you can put a, like, yeah. a guard. You know, before you promote a test to like alert developers, you can like sort of track its flakiness over time right. in a sandbox. Nice. I know that Facebook yeah. presented on that a while back, and um, so like those are there are a bunch of things you can do with infrastructure. Right. I mean, I, if you if you have uh, yeah. you know a team that works on yeah, it. exactly, because like I couldn't even get five days sure. test lab to work because yeah. I'm the only developer on my team yeah. and. I mean, you know, like that's yeah. one great, you know, another great idea for the Firebase team. They could measure the quality of your tests. They could, you know, give you all these stats. Yeah. Right now, you can't even click on a single test and see the history, um, you know, for that test. And that's right. like a thing that to me is a basic sort of test presentation experience, you know. So yeah, um, but, yeah. And so there's uh, there's definitely a, their work is cut out for them. So yeah, cool. <laughs> well, I got some tricks that I'm going to try when I go back. So that's great. Um, if people want to follow you and your good work, where can they find you on the internet? I am trying out the Twitter thing. The Twitter so thing? Valera yeah. underscore Zakharov on Twitter. Cool. Um, so yeah, that would be the place. Great. Well, thank you so much, Valera. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>